Hello, everyone, and welcome to CDP Presents, our monthly webinar series. Uh, we're happy to have you all with us today. And if you have joined us before, welcome back. I'm Kevin Holloway. I'm Director of Training and Education at the Center for Deployment Psychology at the Uniform Services University and part of the CDP Presents team. I'm going to see if I can advance our slides. There we go. All right, so this project is sponsored by the Uniform Services University, USU. However, the information or content and conclusions do not necessarily reflect the official position or policy of, nor should any official endorsement be inferred on the part of USU, the Department of Defense, or the US government. Here's a good snapshot of some of the upcoming trainings we'll be offering in the next couple of months, which can be found under the training tab on CDP's website. Um, I want to highlight a couple of these for you. We've got a few of our CDP Presents webinars uh, coming up September and November we've got listed there. We also have uh, the uh, Assessing Military Clients for Trauma and Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder online coming up. So for those of you who uh, are interested in or have colleagues interested in learning more about assessing for PTSD, that's a great one for you too. Um, so take a look at our, our training tab on CDP's website for upcoming training opportunities there. If you missed last month's webinar, which was uh, titled Treating PTSD and Co-Occurring Substance Use Disorders Using Prolonged Exposure, don't worry, we've got you covered. Uh, you can find the recording on our archived webinars page. If you attended and liked the webinar, please feel free to share it with your colleagues or friends. Uh, CDP is excited to continue to offer our podcast Practical for Your Practice. This is a bi-weekly podcast featuring stories, ideas, support, and actionable intel to empower providers to keep working towards implementing EBPs with fidelity and effectiveness. Uh, be sure to check out all the fantastic episodes of season, season one on the podcast page of our website. We also have five episodes now released in season two so far, including uh, episodes entitled Making an Uncomfortable Conversation More Comfortable, Collaborating with Our Clients to Increase Mean Safety with CDP's own Dr. Sharon Berman. Another episode named Stress is Your Friend, Reinterpreting Stress as Fuel for Performance with Dr. Gabe Paoletti. We've got uh, making, making Cognitive Health and a Priority in Practice, Getting Back to Basics with Compensatory Cognitive Training and CogSmart with Dr. Elizabeth Twomley. Uh, living Our Best Second Lives with CDP's own Dr. Corinne Lefkowitz, and just recently released was Enhancing Resilience with Psychological Flexibility Training with Dr. Wyatt Evans. Uh, so please check out some of those, and don't forget to subscribe to your favorite platform. Before I introduce our speaker for today, I wanted to take a moment to orient you to a few features of Zoom, as though we aren't all Zoom experts by now, right? But uh, we hope that these features will enhance your experience in our, our workshop today, in our webinar today. Uh, you may have entered the webinar in full screen mode. Uh, if that's the case, go ahead and click on your screen and hit the escape key. That will put you in uh, not full screen mode, but that means so that you can see the slides and the chat going on at the same time. For the best user experience today, we recommend that you close all of the programs on your computer. Uh, any, diff any difficulties viewing the materials during the presentation are likely due to a poor connection. Um, while I'm talking, please check the volume level on your computer or device and adjust as needed. Uh, many participants will find it easier to hear the presentation by using headphones. And so if you've got access to those, we recommend you plugging those in and using them for today too. Uh, please note on the chat feature, which you can find by hovering over the bottom of your screen and uh, clicking on the button that says chat, this is a great place for you to enter questions and respond to questions that our speaker may pose or to even interact with other participants. Um, any questions that you put into the chat will be moderated. I'll be watching for those and collecting those, and I'll ask those of our presenter in the final five to ten minutes of our presentation today. Also, though, if you're experiencing any technical difficulties, you can go ahead and type the problem in the chat pod, and someone from our tech support team will assist you. Uh, just make sure that uh, you send your text message to all panelists and attendees, or everyone, I think is what it says in the drop-down menu there, so that everyone can see your questions. Um, if you've got those tech issues, you could you can send those to just host and panelists if you'd like to, but certainly any questions about content, put those in the everyone uh, drop down so that everyone can see those questions and benefit from them. Uh, this webinar series uh, is recorded and will be posted to the Center for Deployment Psychology's website, along with any additional materials and references. Handouts for today's webinar can be found on your CE21 My Accounts page for this event. And then finally, at the end of the webinar, our project manager, Mr. Micah Norgard, will provide information and instructions on how to obtain CEs. In order to obtain CE credit, you must attend the entire webinar and complete the webinar survey in CE21. 
Please note that for this webinar, we're offering American Psychological Association CE credits, which are acceptable to most state licensing boards for different mental health disciplines. Be sure to check the requirements of your own state and to retain any, any documentation associated with the training in case you need to provide that. Okay, now I'm excited to introduce today's presenter. Our presenter today is Dr. Anna Brewer. She is a licensed psychologist and consultant in private practice. She completed her doctorate in human services psychology at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County with concentrations in clinical psychology and behavioral medicine. Her postdoctoral training and early career included trauma specialization and outpatient mental health with the Veterans Health Administration, where she was also a motivational interviewing consultant and regional trainer for the VA's National Evidence-Based Psychotherapy Initiative and faculty membership in the psycholog psychology department at Rockford University. She's a member of the International Motivational Interviewing Network of Trainers, uh, the National Register of Health Service Psychologists, the Florida Psychological Association, and APA. Dr. Brewer is licensed in the states of Florida and Illinois, and she provides consultation and training for a diverse array of helping professionals and organizations around the world. And as I understand it, uh, Dr. Br not Dr. Back, Dr. Brewer has no financial interest to disclose. Um, and so with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn the mic over to Dr. Brewer. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here and be back after um, last year's talk. Um, and I wanted to start out, you know, really just acknowledging um, the work that CDP does and the work that all of you do. Um, it's, it's such a great turnout for a uh, webinar after a couple of years of many, many webinars I'm sure we've all been to and video conference calls. So thank you for taking the time to be on Zoom again um, at this point. And for those of you who might have attended the talk last year, um, we we were thinking and in, in talking with CDP about developing this as sort of a follow-up, um, but not necessarily requiring that you've attended that talk last year. Um, and some of the components that uh, were especially exciting to the audience members last time and wanted to hear a little bit more about is, is how do we move between motivational interviewing and other evidence-based psychotherapies or evidence-based practices that we might be practicing? And how do we do that with balance and grace? And so here we have, um, when I think about balance and grace, dancers and the art that may be uh, motivational interviewing, and there's quite a bit of uh, metaphor to be had with dancing um, and moving with, with grace and balance. At the same time, the first piece that I'd like to acknowledge is when I think about what that actually can feel like in practice um, and myself speaking to balance and grace personally, something more like this comes to my mind. Um, and, and because there are a lot of opportunities to stumble in our work with people, um, this is not uh, choreographed. And it's often, even when we have sort of a, a manual or a protocol to work from, what we're really relying on is uh, our own uh, experience, and that can grow and change over time. So we might think of ourselves like this baby elephant sometimes, just learning and falling and stumbling. I know that, that I feel like that often in uh, new environments or new skill sets, and MI was sort of an opportunity to learn a new skill set that um, I stumbled quite a lot with early on when I began practicing it um, many years ago. And and as you look at this image, the other piece to think about is that um, it, what you feel for this little baby elephant, the perhaps the empathy, um, the part of you that feels that kind of awe, um, poor, poor thing, um, that, that compassion that we have for others, is, those are really important resources to draw upon when we practice MI and with balance and grace. And we'll be coming back to that throughout our time today, those qualities in ourselves um, that uh, we, we can't necessarily technically um, identify really empirically, we're working on it, but we have to recognize there's an art to this and a personal component that's just human. Um, and I'll be speaking a little bit to the, the evidence piece as well and the science of MI and how we think about it in terms of a skill set that's helpful in complementing our other evidence-based practices. And so with that being said, the overview of our time today, I'll be talking a lot about the rationale for moving between motivational interviewing and other EVPs. Why would we do it? How do we think about it? When may be the time to do that? And maybe when, when not to. Um, and 
part of the rationale will also include how do you as a practitioner conceptualize your cases and think about behavior change? And so ambivalence is a really important concept in motivational interviewing. And we'll be talking a bit about how our, our understanding of MI is uh, in relation to ambivalence is, is really key. And in thinking about that conceptualization, it, it, your rationale for applying MI in your work is really going to be whether you could buy into this conceptualization of ambivalence and behavior change. Um, and I say buy into, we'll talk a little bit about different uh, approaches to psychotherapy and different theoretical orientations that may be more readily integrated with MI and those that may not. I'm acknowledging, I'm keeping, sort of keeping one eye over on the chat. I know uh, Kevin's gonna do a great job with that today. Um, and I wanted to invite you as you look at this overview, Think about questions you might have. You might already be coming in with questions about this, and you might also be coming in with um, a, a new uh, uh, sort of fresh fresh eyes for MI. As, as I talk about MI and ambivalence, as I talk about the components of MI, the spirit and the core skills, I'll be um, touching on these sort of briefly, uh, and then I'll be moving into the four processes of motivational interviewing. That is perhaps the newest innovation in MI in the last uh, nine, 10 years. Um, and so moving through those four processes with intention and again with balance and grace for the other interventions that you're doing. I'll also be talking about, um, we shifting gears quite a bit and talking about this concept of resistance and how we relate to it in motivational interviewing from our perspective of breaking it down into its component parts. And so I'll be describing those component parts and giving some clinical practice examples and asking you all to think about how might you respond in a way that is perhaps consistent with motivational interviewing, and how might that differ uh, from when you are in, are in another mode um, and when you shift intentionally into that. And then finally, we'll talk a bit about growing in MI proficiency, that one or two webinars may be really helpful and maybe sort of um, open up your, um, your interest in MI or refresh your interest in motivational interviewing, uh, but it may not get you to that proficiency that uh, we seek when we're practicing this in terms of actually enhancing motivation and behavior change. And then we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. So what I'm hoping that you'll take from this time is an ability to recognize the essential spirit and core skills of motivational interviewing. And both the spirit and the core skills are about addressing ambivalence, resolving ambivalence toward behavior change, uh, as well as fostering a, a useful connection th throughout the therapy um, or your conversations and collaborations with other individuals. And so I'm also hoping that then you'll understand how does MI work to address ambivalence about behavior change? How does it help support a strong therapeutic relationship and complement other evidence-based psychotherapies uh, in promoting engagement in them and as well as in, um, com uh, I think about the word compliance, but I also think about the um, benefit of those therapies that it may be uh, complementary in a way that enhances both our skills at NMI as well as our skills in those practices. I've seen more and more people log on. Good morning from Travis Air Force Base. Hello, Elise, um, and Fairfax, Virginia, Nebraska. You know, some of what I'm interested in is where you're all from and also what your interests are in MI. So please feel free to use the chat to sort of communicate with each other. And um, it's so nice to, to see you there. I can't see your faces. I'm glad you can see mine. Um, and Bahrain, far away. Welcome. Thank you. So in acknowledging where MI was developed, the, the co-creators of it, and they, they, um, Bill and Steve, and I'm happy to be able to refer them by first name, um, having nice conversations with them every few years, they, um, we would say that they didn't create MI, but they sort of discovered it and found it through other practices um, and connecting through um, the context of substance use for Bill Miller um, and um, looking back at um, his training in um, humanistic approaches and Carl Rogers person-centered counseling um, and then for for Steve Rolnick really coming in with a with a technical mindset and really understanding what are the components of this that are effective and so they 
been developing this and writing and rewriting um, since since the 1980s. And in the most recent edition of motivational interviewing, the the question of um, integrating MI with other approaches that was often at a time when comparisons of interventions, comparing EVPs uh, through randomized control trials and um, assigning people to different interventions and really finding that um, maybe there's a lot of benefit to all of them. Um, the question became less of comparing it and more so integrating it makes more sense uh, to Bill and Steve than regarding MI as an alternative standalone treatment to compete with or compare with other approaches. And so, so much of what we're finding is that those who have motivational interviewing training and practice it um, perhaps as a prelude um, to other interventions, not only does it enhance the connection and the relationship, the engagement um, with that provider, but then also the engagement throughout the other intervention. It's an enhancement in that way. How do we do that and integrate it in an intentional way um, and, and know when and how to do that that's most effective? And as we talk a bit about that, I want to provide some examples uh, from, and I'll speak a bit to my own experience with my specializations, um, as well as to some considerations to, to hold on to when we think about is it time and when and how do we integrate this with other EVPs. So I'm, I'm, what I'm going to list here are um, presenting concerns, conditions, um, diagnoses, uh, rather than particular interventions, particular therapies that might complement most of them. I'll speak a little bit to those, uh, but I don't think it depends on on exactly which intervention is thinking about the patient population, the presenting concerns, and, and when am I might be helpful. Um, this list is uh, largely also consistent with um, Arkowitz, Miller, and Rolnick's book from 2017 on motivational interviewing in, uh, for mental health. So the beginning of MI in addictions and substance use, um, and we think about the uh, large um, project match um, study where MI was one of the interventions, motivational enhancement therapy, compared with CBT and 12-step facilitation, and we found them all to be effective. Um, and since that time, there's been an emphasis on beginning our um, interventions for some addictions and substance use with MI, starting with meeting a person where they are is often the language that we hear. We may think about anxiety disorders. So in my experience, uh, the applications of anxiety disorders may be more so when we're thinking about uh, providing a rationale or engaging with a person around what, what therapy may be most effective for them. And so in my own experience um, as a mental health provider, I've talked with a lot of folks about exposure therapies for anxiety disorders. Um, and when we're preparing to go into those, there's a, an often an opportunity to shift into motivational interviewing when there's ambivalence about starting those therapies. Um, and we may be talking with, with individuals about what it is that is important to them and why they might want to engage in a, in a pretty sometimes difficult um, or very different from the therapies that they've done before. Um, and so the application may most be fitting in terms of readiness for therapy and engagement in those therapies. Borderline personality disorder. So some of the evidence here may be also talking about readiness to engage in an evidence-based therapy, for example, dialectical behavior therapy. Um, and, and at the beginning in those, in, uh, first few sessions of um, making a uh, sort of a treatment um, plan with a, a person experiencing borderline and who wants to see some behavior change in their lives. Uh, we may be bringing MI a lot into DBT. I know for myself, as having been on a DBT team, uh, so much of the MI skills were brought in in those first few sessions. And then we may be shifting more into a style that is more consistent with the DBT approach. Um, and so there's really an opportunity to be our authentic selves and connect with this person and then and also to even talk transparently about we're going to shift styles now we're going to shift into DBT as they're ready to do that. Um, and and we can talk a little bit more about that too. Another um, target behavior we might think about in the context of borderline personality disorder is uh, suicide behavior or self-harm behaviors. And that MI as an approach to talking with people about their motivation to change those behaviors. 
And so what I hope you're noticing is that we can talk about the engagement in therapy and how MI is helpful, as well as the um, particular target behavior changes in the context of that therapy. In depression, uh, we may be talking about, for example, behavioral activation um, and getting started with behavior change um, and what that might look like for that person, their motivation to do that. We may be thinking about depression as a condition in which low motivation is, is pretty common. And so we may be thinking about it as particularly applicable, but I want to talk about a caveat of that in a moment. Eating disorders, not one of my main areas of specialization, um, but here we might be talking about um, a target behaviors, uh, for example, um, monitoring caloric intake, increasing caloric intake, reducing um, restricting behaviors, and that our awareness of, okay, this, there's more ambivalence about the restricting behaviors than maybe there is um, about changing um, the, the caloric intake. So there's complicated factors here that in the moment we may be thinking, what is the target behavior? Where is the ambivalence? And that may be my cue to, to shift into more of an MI style. Gambling, um, to go back to the addictions and substance use disorders, um, we're talking often with um, the same uh, conceptualization as um, process addictions or behavioral um, compulsive behaviors in, in gambling, um, and it maybe it's engagement in a, in a gambling treatment, or we're actually applying it in the context of behaving, changing gambling behaviors. I'm, I'm glancing over, I see Colby, I'm interested in using MI with people who want to stop mid-treatment um, during an EBP for PTSD or substance use. That is one of my specialty areas, and um, I'll, I'll provide several examples from my own experience with that. And I'm, I'm interested in how you all are thinking about that for in your own work and when to conceptualize it as ambivalence versus avoidance. And we'll come back to that in a little bit. Insomnia. And so here, um, in my experience uh, as a uh, provider of cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, we may be talking, uh, again, at the intake of the ambivalence to um, engage in an EBP. Perhaps they've tried um, other medication management, perhaps um, Ambien, uh, for many years, and they and there's some ambivalence about um, trying something different, or um, perhaps the target behavior is uh, reducing the Ambien. That's that's um, an intervention in a research study I've been involved in as well. There may be when we're going into the uh, particular. Um, sleep guidelines, and we're talking about each of those behavior changes. There's a lot of micro behaviors to change when we're treating insomnia. There may be ambivalence um, more about some of those behaviors than there is about others. And so, for for example, caffeine intake. Maybe a person is perfectly willing to change their sleep schedule, but really unsure um, and struggling around uh, reducing caffeine. And so that may be a target to shift into at that moment um, when we're talking about those guidelines. Interpersonal violence, uh, this is an area where we can may be working with survivors, we may be working with per perpetrators of abuse, and we may be talking about motivation to uh, change those behaviors in perpetrators. Uh, this is a context uh, in which I've worked before in um, a, a treatment program, uh, mandated treatment. Uh, for perpetrators of abuse. And so um, with abusive partners, we're often talking about, well, you have to be here. If, uh, and then talking about what actually, where are their choices in that? What would happen if they weren't? And that um, some of what we're emphasizing is that, that ch the choice to make those changes to have a life that they want. And then uh, with, the, with people in, um, surviving abuse or living in those relationships, we might be applying MI um, compassionately when they're deciding whether to stay or whether to leave that relationship. And there's a lot of uh, often debate in the field about when is it okay to um, be enhancing motivation toward a particular decision like leaving a partner. And, um, and this may be a choice as a clinician that we have to make. If, if we want to apply MI, we are not neutral. Uh, we are actually evoking toward a particular target behavior with that person. OCD, again, kind of um, consistent uh, with their approaches in anxiety disorders or treatment engagement in EBPs that may be difficult um, or may represent a, a large shift when we're moving into exposure therapies um, that might be really applicable when we're talking about engagement in those therapies. And PTSD. And so the, um, the treatment engagement component comes up again, um, as well as thinking about the, in my experience, main 
staying consistent with the therapy or maintaining um, and reducing uh, attrition from those therapies, reducing dropout, um, that what we might be doing is shifting in back into what, what makes this therapy important for you, what makes the trauma work important for you. And we'll be talking about the skills and approaches in doing that. I'll provide several examples. And smoking cessation having been one of the um, earliest uh, areas of intervention with MI um, and um, my, I think my back to my thesis research was on, on smoking cessation and, and different ways that that comes up in people's lives. And MI has been perhaps one of the most uh, widely researched uh, in, in smoking cessation behavioral intervention, brief interventions, where we can be talking about um, often the motivation is there. Uh, the people have tried to quit eight to 10 times. And so what we're talking a lot about is drawing upon those past successes and their, their ability to make those changes. And finally, another area that maybe, as I mentioned with borderline personality disorder, um, we would be talking about uh, suicide risk behaviors, self-harm behaviors, and suicidal ideation. Uh, this is perhaps a more recent area of research in MI is thinking about um, motivation to live, that the target behavior may be living, a choice to live, um, the reasons for living, the desire to live, um, and that that may be uh, an area where MI is applicable and talking about evoking a person's own motivation for living. Um, this can be perhaps the most existential and fundamental question that, that we're dealing with in, in our work um, in mental health and, um, and that MI may be really applicable to that. And some people may feel that that's very difficult to, um, to conceptualize in that way. Um, and so as we think about when and how to know, this is a long list, it's not exhaustive at all when it comes to behavior change and mental health. So we think about MI, I tend to just think it's applicable in nearly any helping relationship when we're talking with people about behaviors that they have the capacity to change intentionally and for their own well-being. And so it may not be applicable when perhaps we're talking about behaviors that they that are out of their control. Say perhaps they're, uh, they want to um, live in a particular environment. I, I want to uh, move into a better community and don't have the resources. Um, and so what we're talking about there is actually perhaps taking a more active role in, in helping people find those resources. We can't enhance motivation towards something a person wants to do but doesn't have the support or social context that, that supports that. Um, and this is often connected sometimes to thinking about substance use behavior change um, when the environment is not supportive of recovery and we may be helping people find environments that are supportive. And then for their own well-being. So we don't necessarily decide what is the target behavior um, because we think it's for their own well-being, but because we can connect to that person on why they might think it would be important for their own well-being. Talk more about that with the spirit of MI. As I mentioned, there are some considerations for when MI, integrating MI with other EBPs may not be um, recommended. And we might think about severity and capacity. And so um, in the context of serious mental illness, MI has been researched and it is applicable. The people uh, living with serious mental illness or severe mental illness, uh, schizophrenia, uh, severe bipolar disorder, these individuals experience behavior change in much the same way as anyone else. Um, and so an intervention that's designed to connect with a person as a human and to enhance their own motivation for change is certainly applicable. There may be uh, slower processes going on in there. We may, it may be um, our, the time and the connection with that person may be really important to take our time with. Um, and at the same time, when a person is not in contact with reality in that moment, when there's, it's difficult to connect in a way that um, we can understand their motivations and, and have that empathy that's really key in MI, um, that may be less applicable in that moment, um, their capacity for decision making. And so there's some of our clinical judgment in that. Readiness for change. When a person is very ready and willing and able and, and ready to go, it might may slow things down. It may not be necessary. It's about resolving ambivalence. If there isn't any, it's perhaps not the most applicable. And so our, our skills for talking with and sort of assessing their readiness for change um, and, and thinking about the micro changes involved in that, um, there may be parts where they're like, nope, I'm good to go on that. We don't have to sort of spin our wheels. Um, and then there may be other areas where it is more applicable when they're not sure or when their readiness is uh, tentative. Time management, I really only think about this in terms of um, 
I most often think about it in terms of your setting and the environment. If the expectation is you are being referred um, a client to uh, start an EVP and they're ready to go and you and and uh, you're you're in a treatment setting where you are expected to just do that EVP. And so what session are you on in that? I know um, I've worked with many clinicians where there is, okay, start the EVP and, 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 and then you will refer them back to their therapist. Sometimes that can put a, a bit of pressure on us in time management or the expectation that the person is really ready when they walk in the door. And we may be um, then thinking about from an MI consistent perspective um, that ambivalence is normal and that they may be less ready by the time they see you than they were when they got referred. And so thinking about time as uh, we don't manage that for them, um, we're just really sort of connecting with them at a point in time in their life. And if they, um, if the setting requires that we, we only have this much time with that person, maybe we're talking about applying MI um, with our team and with our way we think about behavior change and getting a little bit more flexible in terms of that rigid structure. Then we might think also about conceptual fit. Um, the invitation I'll have for you through the next hour is to think about does the rationale for MI, the spirit of MI um, fit with, with your uh, beliefs and your case conceptualization, um, the theory behind the intervention that you're engaging in. Um, do these components that we'll go into momentarily um, can fit conceptually? And there is um, a different conceptualization of both ambivalence as well as our relationship, what our role is with our clients when we're engaged in MI. And if we are um, shifting gracefully and with balance in between MI and other EVPs, and those EVPs don't um, fit with that conceptualization or, or our style doesn't, it may be pretty jarring to uh, the relationship with the client um, and may actually interfere with, with both of those things. So I'll invite you to think about that and, and you as a clinician um, make that decision for, for your own work and in the time that you're with a person. So the first piece of conceptualization I want to talk a bit about again is ambivalence. So I've mentioned this repeatedly. Um, in MI, we recognize that ambivalence is a normal and natural aspect in the process of behavior change. So normal and natural, I think about that. It's it change can be hard, even when we really want to do something, even when we really want to make that that dive or that leap or that change. Um, there may be difficult emotions that come up. There may be reactions from other people that uh, we're concerned about, and and there may may be fear, anxiety. Um, there may be doubt in ourselves. We can see a lot of that in this. The, the, the painting by Norman Rockwell, um, not one of my favorite artists per se, but I do think that it captures a bit about uh, the emotions of ambivalence and, and this young man who, who perhaps wants to make this dive and is feeling unsure. And so the invitation to think about ambivalence as normal and natural and not a problem to be solved, but as a um, something to connect with and have empathy for as a, as a fellow human. Um, and, and MI does seek to resolve ambivalence, um, but we start first with a connection to another person experiencing it as a, as a natural and normal part of the process of change, and that we can help people move through that ambivalence toward behavior change, because we can go away from behavior change when we're in a setting that pushes against us um, or uh, expects us to, to, to move more fast than we're ready to do. And so how do we recognize ambivalence? How do we know that it shows up? Um, if, you, if you'd like to use the chat for this, uh, you might um, think about the next piece and, and maybe you're already familiar with how does MI help us to hear the language of change, the language of ambivalence and change. There are two sides to this. And so there's the language that uh, we hear our clients say when they are um, sort of wanting to stay the same, the part of them that wants to stay the same. What do we call that? And so I'd love to see, you know, in the chat here, if you can recognize or, or share with us, um, what is that language called? Yeah, from our clients, what, when, when, People are speaking about their reasons for staying the same, why they don't want to make a change. Uh, sustained talk, yeah, sustained talk. Right, right. And so, Amanda, we will come back to resistance and what that, how we think about that um, in MI, because sustained talk is 
the language that we hear that favors staying the same. And it's part of our rethinking resistance, that there may be a component of what we call resistance is actually sustained talk. It is a very natural and normal expression of ambivalence, the side of us that wants to stay the same. What do we call the language that is based in the desire to uh, make a behavior change, the desire to see things be different? Change talk, yeah. That's one thing I love about it, it's it's elegant. It's not uh, <laughs> it's, um, simple. And, and also not easy. Um, so the ability to keep listen for these, that's a lot of what we're tuning our ears to when we're practicing MI. And so when we're moving between MI and other EBPs, I sort of always have uh, my, my change talk ears on um, that's listening for people saying, yeah, I really wanna do this, or um, here's what why I wanna do this. Um, here's maybe why I need to, even if there's a big part of me that doesn't want to there are some needs that I have. And so we're listening for that self-expressed speech from our clients and listening for that more than preparing it ourselves. We're not convincing. We're, we don't get as much out of um, providing people with reasons to change as they do from hearing it from themselves. And so what we do with that language of ambivalence is is key um, in thinking about what MI is. I didn't want to just give the definition as I had in my talk last year. And so um, you, may, you may go back to sort of basic definition of what MI is. When I think about it in my mind, it's two main components. It's the relationship, the relational components of what we're doing and connecting with another person, normalizing ambivalence, and then also the technical components that help us to enhance the change talk, evoke that change talk. and move, uh, help people to move in the direction of behavior change themselves. And so relationship and technical skills, relational and technical. Another way of thinking about that in MI is essentially these three components. We've got the spirit of motivational interviewing, and we'll go into the components of the spirit um, that is, is, is less technical. It's more about a relationship and also a set of beliefs as a clinician, a set of capacities as a clinician and ways that we embody that uh, normalizing of ambivalence as well as evoking behavior change. And then we've got our core skills that help us kind of move through that. The core skills are not unique to MI. Um, they are just applied in a particular way to evoke the spirit in ourselves and to move through what we call the four processes. We'll be talking about that as well. The spirit of MI, as we talk about this, as, as we go through this, I'd like to invite you to think about if this is, uh, again, consistent with how you think about individuals, how you think about humanity. Um, and I know in my um, clinical training, uh, there were many different theoretical orientations introduced, uh, many different um, biological, psychological, social bases of behavior introduced, and and less emphasis perhaps on how I relate to other humans um, and understand these things. And so in MI, there's a strong emphasis on us embodying the spirit um, and thinking about, do I believe this about humanity? And that connects often. So I'm gonna start with evocation because that is the, the core that makes MI maybe different from other styles of connecting, styles of counseling, styles of conversation and theoretical orientations. Um, the evocation component is um, specific to our recognition that people have the capacity to change themselves, that so much of what they need for change is already inside of them. And so that we're not actually making anyone change, we're not actually doing anything to anyone else, um, that those capacities are within them. That motivation is inside of another person. We don't motivate anyone. They have that inside of them. And that also part of what we're connecting to is a person's values in their own life. And as I use the word values, many of you may be thinking about other interventions that also uh, connect to a person's values. Um, and so, this is often very consistent with, for example, acceptance and commitment therapy um, and interventions that look at, well, what do humans uh, tend to need? How does that show up in our lives? What does that look like um, within cultures, across cultures? What does it look like for this individual? And so really what we're, sh we're doing is shining a light on those that person's values, that person's um, interests, their desires, and their own 
personal qualities that are unique to them, uh, that everyone has that. And so in the MI spirit, we, we're not instilling that in anyone, we're just evoking it out of them. Also consistent with perhaps ACT or other interventions that, um, that really rely on the concept of acceptance. Now, in other, those interventions, we're teaching acceptance, right? We're um, helping people to enhance their um, ability to accept emotions, accept difficult experiences. In MI, the spirit, we are practicing acceptance of that person. And so we bring the accepting qualities in the room um, each time we meet with a person. And the four aspects within that, uh, these I, I think are are so essential, but often get um, minimized. They're often, okay, just accept wherever that person is in the process of change. The acceptance components really has much less to do with the process of change than it does to do with how we relate to other humans. And so this broad concept of absolute worth, um, it really is, is really more based in humanism, um, that we see that every human has worth and value, even if they don't change. It, it isn't even reliant on seeing that a person has potential or that every single person has purpose in life. It's actually that every single person has worth as they are in that moment, absolutely. Um, and that we, we don't actually have to see another person change for us to see that worth or recognize that um, in them. And I think this is helpful because as, you, as I share with you that list of clinical contexts in which MI may be helpful, many of those are, are often thought of as very difficult case presentations or very, um, very severe, challenging um, clients, for, for example. And for me, in embodying the spirit of MI, it's been a gift to help me to reconnect with the person as a human and to um, not experience these as difficult cases or difficult conditions because it's really about the person and their, there's absolute worth regardless of what they're experiencing. The second component is autonomy. Um, these aren't in any particular order. Um, it, the autonomy is is inherent in, we see it in three-year-olds. We see it in kids that need to um, move about the world and explore on their own and set their own boundaries and, and cross those boundaries at times and make choices on their own. Um, and so, as I mentioned, um, mandated clients that had, that are assigned to uh, therapy in order to meet some legal requirement, they may not feel like there's much autonomy in that. There still is choice. Um, there, there are difficult choices, but there is autonomy in, them, in those choices. And I, I, I've experienced um, our skill set for um, and affirming that autonomy, for reminding people of that autonomy without irony, without um, any sort of uh, uh, consideration of consequences, but really just recognizing their autonomy to make these choices, that that is um, often um, diffuses so much of what we might think of as resistance. We'll talk about that in a bit. Affirmation is both a skill and a, and a component of the spirit. And this is, this comes naturally, I think, when we embody absolute worth um, and believe that about people is we can see qualities to affirm. When we see that no matter where a person is in their struggle, they have worth as a human, it's often uh, an opening to see things we can easily affirm in them. It's not just, you came here today and that's great, um, or look at you working so hard on your homework. Um, it's they're what they care about, and that when you are moved by that, to share that with another person may be one of the most important qualities in, in the practice of MI, is, is actually sharing when, and, and listening to when we are moved by another person's qualities and their efforts. And then finally, accurate empathy. So that's the part of us that um, balances the um, uh, em emotional empathy or um, the sometimes the sympathy that we feel when you see that baby elephant ball and you feel that, oh, um, pain for them. There's the part of us that can feel that. And then the part of us that is able to recognize maybe that's not exactly how they feel. Um, just because I feel that when I hear them, um, there's something important about listening to that empathy, um, but is that you're also able to say, okay, I'm, I'm always striving to better understand. And even though I can 
feel some of what maybe I imagine they're feeling, I'm going to check on that. I'm going to reflect what I what I think they might be feeling, um, and be humble about our ability to be accurate about that, and um, continually to know we're never going to fully get there and be in another person's shoes. We're going to we're going to communicate that and try. So part of acceptance as a as the spirit of MI is continually trying to embody that. Um, and get, get more and more accurate in our understanding of another person by communicating that to them. Not that I'm trying to understand, of course that's there, but, but it more valuably is to reflect what they're saying and to um, take guesses as to what that meaning is and allow them to correct us, allow ourselves to be wrong and continually try to get there. There's an, this is, to me, marries very well with cultural humility um, and recognizing that um, our worldview is, is different than than many other people's and vice versa, and that we, um, we, there's no superior or better worldview or more accurate um, way of perceiving. And in fact, when we can step out of that and say that more accurate is when I can communicate and reflect back to another person with humility and allow them to correct me. And okay, let's keep going um, and work on that together. Then I think we are connecting to our greater, higher level of compassion. And so this is a concept in, in MI, not unique to MI, but borrowed from um, many other human experiences and, and counseling styles and intervention styles and um, you know, spiritual approaches uh, that Bill Miller thought was important to add um, about nine years ago in the last edition of MI, because the skills we're about to go into can be used to help sell a car or promote a treatment intervention that the person may not really need and may not actually be for their own well-being. And so it is tapping into not just my desire to help the person make a change so that we, they can um, be another effective um, example of this intervention um, or the work that I do, but really because I care about their well-being and hear from them that they see that this would be good for their well-being as well. Um, and so it complements empathy and it is the higher level of that. Um, have a really strong interest in the, the neurological basis of this. We're just seeing more and more that um, compassion is the antidote to empathic distress and burnout. And that when we can embody that continually, our work will be more effective um, and we can, we can do more of it. And finally, partnership. And so in MI, this is where I wanted to invite you to think, do, do I believe this as a clinician and then I can marry this with my other interventions is, um, that the partnership is equal, that we are not clinicians with um, interventions to do to another person, but, but with and for, um, and that the change that another person makes um, is their choice and they're, they're the expert on their lives, so that we are two experts sharing our knowledge and understanding and working together um, very much as equals. And in many times, what that might look like in MI is actually stepping down from a position of authority that sometimes our, our clients may see us as um, or put us into or that our setting might um, and um, our titles might do that. And so sometimes it means stepping down and empowering our clients by taking a lower position in the relationship and being very, very humble in that. Um, and sometimes it may, may mean mirroring in many ways um, that what they're asking for. Okay, this is what I'd like. Okay, how can I do that for and with you in a way that's, that's helpful? So as we move into how do we do that? Okay, so that spirit, those components fit and maybe seem um, workable for you. And that's something that you're already feeling and already doing. Well, then how do you know it's MI? Um, in many ways, it's the technical skills that allow us to strategically uh, know that we're practicing MI to help us kind of move through the water of that relationship. These are um, often, we know these. So um, I'd love to see again in the chat if they can uh, put up any of the ORs, uh, what, are the, what does that stand for? What does the acronym ORs stand for? And I think we've got that as a group. Um, and so I'd love to see um, if anyone can tell me what the O stands for, the A, the R, the S. Yeah, open-ended questions. That's right. So open-ended questions, um, questions that uh, cannot be um, only responded to with the yes or no but that require elaboration or invite elaboration. We may still get yes or no to some of these um, or short, short questions. How are you today? Fine. Um, but we're asking with 
the spirit with really caring, with compassion, with evocation in mind. And we can also use these questions intentionally to ask for that person's own reasons for wanting to change. What makes this important to you? What what makes better sleep important to you? And that when I've asked that question in the context of whether it's PTSD treatment or anxiety treatment or insomnia treatment, when people say, I just want to sleep better, I want to feel better, um, what makes that important to you? What would you like, what would that mean in your life? And there's often a, um, wow, I didn't expect that question. Um, it's, it's not obvious. We're not assuming that we know better sleep means X, Y, Z, that a person can say, well, I'd, I'd be less irritable. Um, I'd have more time for my family. I wouldn't be uh, drinking so much uh, or um, smoking so much if I if I slept better. Um, and we never know. So we may be asking open questions with curiosity, and with then we are actually in, kind of filling up our bank of change talk in that person. We understand why is they want to make this change. Affirmations. I spoke to that. We've got that. Yep, Teresa, you got the RAS. Thank you. <laughs> and Cheyenne Reflections. Um, these are the affirmations and reflections in the research. Is, um, those two pieces are perhaps the most uh, important. And um, uh, me mechanistically, the, the uh, mechanisms of MI, we thought reflections maybe were the, the most important piece um, that we are um, responding back with to demonstrate our empathy and to reflect back the change talk from clients and affirmation. Um, they may be as important, but not as frequent that they need to be authentic and genuine um, when we are moved by a person's experience to, to share that. And thank you, Justin. Summaries. So summaries are simply a, a, a fancy form of a reflection that just takes more of the uh, flowers of change talk that we've heard over the course of that few minutes and offers them back all together. Um, or perhaps when we're transitioning to a new topic or we're, we're listing many of the potential areas of behavior change back to a person and saying, I've heard, I've heard you want it, you want your sleep to improve, you, you'd like to, um, your, to, your mood to improve, you'd like to have less free experiencing symptoms and, and um, intrusions throughout the day, um, and you'd like a better relationship with your family. Uh, that, that's a summary of their, of their reasons for change. Um, and that may be really important for them to hear back that all the things they've said. The I for information exchange. So I didn't ask for this because we often don't think of it as one of the core skills of MI. We're moving in that direction um, in our understanding that the skill of providing information as an expert that we all often have, um, and in EBPs, this often means giving the rationale, um, that in MI, we're thinking of it rather than me implanting that information or convincing you or um, or sharing all this education, psychoeducation we might think of, is actually exchanging information and, and using our other ORs to ask, what do you already know about this therapy? Um, what is your understanding of how exposure works? And, and it's been, for me, very helpful for time management because I'm actually getting from them or their understanding can save a lot of time and that, yeah, okay, yeah, so you already get X, Y, Z, and then can be um, sharing in any pieces that maybe perhaps they're missing um, or collaborating on the parts that they, need, they have the most doubt about. And I can really hear that ambivalence more clearly when I ask them, what is it that, that this means to you? Um, so that information exchange, we'll talk a little bit more about as we go forward. This piece, the four processes, is the water itself. So we've got the spirit is sort of, I think of as, as the, my vessel that I come alongside another person in, the ores that help me to do that technically move through with them. The four processes is the, what we're doing in that, in that intervention, in the intervention that is MI. And first, we're simply engaging. This is not unique to MI. Hopefully, we're doing this from the beginning, working with new clients, and also throughout the therapeutic relationship. And that um, we'll talk a bit about any time that the relationship seems ruptured or um, that perhaps there is uh, a lot of sustained talk coming up, um, that we can shift back into engaging and sort of ground ourselves, reground ourselves in the spirit and emphasize that therapeutic relationship. The, the working alliance, um, that conceptualization of the bond, the, uh, the goal that we're collaborating on, and then the tasks that we were required to get there, coming back to the bond is being really important. Um, and because if, it's, if 
if there isn't that bond, then we not only um, won't be able to move into the next process that I'll share with you, um, but if we, if a person then may, they may be telling us what we want to hear. Yeah, okay, 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 yeah, I'm going to make that change, and they don't come back. And so the important piece there is that um, we're on being on the same page together. And this is where I think we move into focusing, okay, what is that page? Where are we, what are we working on? Um, it's their agenda, not ours. Um, even if we were referred uh, this client with a particular uh, reason or question or um, provider wants us to treat X um, and that client really wants to recover from Y, um, we want to clarify that direction together and finding a target behavior. This is where summaries are often really helpful too when a client comes in an intake with so many different concerns and um, per perhaps areas of their life they'd like to see change and we can summarize all of that and then and then use an open question and ask, what's most important to you right now? Or where do you see um, of these things? What's sort of getting in the way of the life that you want? Um, and we can offer in that um, our ability to listen for their change talk and what we've heard from them back to them and use reflections for that. And that's when we move into evoking. And so this is actually the heart of MI and perhaps the start of it when you say, well, I already do engaging and focusing with all of my clients. Those are not unique to MI. But with, with the ears for change talk and the ability to um, embody that spirit that this person has their own reasons for change, even if they're hard to hear, um, they're hard to find or listen to for, uh, that's what we're going to spend a little bit of time on. And not jumping right into, okay, so you'd like to your sleep to get better, or you'd like your, um, you'd like to have less of PTSD symptoms, let's plan for the therapy that you want to do. Actually spending some time in the why um, and the um, envisioning with them what that would look like in their life, I think is one of the most important pieces to bridge to planning, how to get there. Um, and the asterisk here on the planning piece is that it is not required to be effective MI that we get to a plan at the end of a session, or even in that first 15 minutes and working with someone when we might be bringing more of an MI style. Um, that the, if, if, they're, if they're saying, yeah, there's, there are a lot of areas that I can see change in my life and we spend a little bit more time on one, we focus, we talk a little bit about those um, PTSD symptoms for a little bit. What, is, what does that look like for you? What have you thought about in terms of, of treatments for that? And they are not really sure they are ready for say a trauma, focused EVP, um, just having had that am I consistent and connected evoking conversation, um, we think about as planting a seed, but also making it more likely they're going to come back and talk more about those interventions or engage more fully in the next session. When we get into planning and say, yeah, here's when I, why I want to do it, I'm okay, let's do it or when I leave here today, I am gonna to reduce that caffeine intake, um, that we can spend some time in what lets you know you're capable. In MI, we're shifting from talking about barriers. Okay, what are the barriers? How are you gonna go overcome them? We might do that a little bit in planning, but there's a stronger suggestion in the, in the research that the hope that we bring and the confidence that we evoke in that person is more useful than planning to address every single barrier. I might, might let you think about that for a moment, that spending more time in hope and confidence than in barriers and problem solving may better predict behavior change. This is a shift um, that we're coming to understand. And again, we can't give hope, we can't just give confidence, like we can't just give motivation to other people um, or convince them, we evoke it from them. What lets you know you can do this? What may be helpful? So I wanna then in our, in our last few minutes, talk really about this, um, what is the biggest barrier to moving through? What, what blocks come up in that water as we're moving through the four processes? It's what we used to call resistance, right? It's, um, they're just, uh, and we, we probably hear it a lot in our, our team meetings or with um, providers who uh, maybe have a, a style that isn't so consistent with MI, um, that client just is a resistant or um, just isn't, isn't ready. Um, and, and as we think about it, how do you know that? What, what came up in the conversation that kind of let us know that resistance is there? Um, and the, we see it in nature, yeah, thanks Jacqueline. We see um, that it's, it's body language sometimes, it's, um, it's their tone of voice sometimes. And, uh, and so if someone's saying, well, they're, they were just really um, angry um, and they're, they're really not ready, they don't wanna work with us, um, they don't wanna be here, 
what we might be talking more about is discord in the relationship, in their relationship to us in the clinical setting or to us as a clinician or to therapy itself. Um, that's a relational piece. And then if they said, well, they've got all these barriers, they're, they're, um, they're really still struggling with their substance use, they're, um, they're uh, not sure that they, they want to do a trauma-focused EBP, they're, they've heard terrible things about exposure, um, that may be more about the behavior change. So that's sustain talk. And so we've deconstructed resistance into its two component parts. Sustain talk is about the target behavior or change itself. Discord is about your relationship with the client or that client's relationship with the therapeutic setting. And as we dismantle it and think about these two components, there are different approaches, different technical skills in MI that we use to respond to each of these. They're, they're not all different. There's an overlap in the Venn diagram of how we, how we um, approach these. Uh, there are two, two, at least two really important differences that I wanted to talk about as we look at some case examples. So sustained talk, um, the, you've, already, you've already been able to recognize that sustained talk are the, the reasons not to change, the desires to stay the same, the um, I don't need to change, the, the barriers for that, um, that a person has tried so many times, the uh, lack of hope or confidence that comes up for people, um, that side of ambivalence. And then discord may come up in other ways. So what I want to describe are some um, ex clinical examples, and what I'd like us to do is see what do you think is it more sustained talk about a behavior change or discord in the relationship or about the relationship with uh, therapy okay so I'll take a look at the um, chat here for this the client might say and you might have heard this from a veteran or service member I've had doctors and therapists who I could tell had just given up on veterans one straight up told me I wasn't ever going to get better you're in the engaging process with the person it's an intake or it's the early part of the therapeutic relationship all right, discord, 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 discord. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Um, I love that. So quickly able to recognize that this isn't a person who um, is, is, is not motivated. This isn't a person who's not ready, right? This isn't a person who's um, stuck, uh, as we might think about it. This isn't sustained talk as much as it is discord about relationships with therapists. Yeah. And so, how do we respond to discord? We used to say in MI, we roll with resistance. Now we think about what do we do with discord? Um, well, first we have to recognize it. Yeah, so as soon as they say that I've had doctors, when they're talking about other providers, they're talking about their relationship um, with helpers or with helping relationships. Our ability to recognize discord is important. Um, and I wanna, you, you might be hearing uh, my, uh, a, a, some crying in the background. I want to acknowledge that um, I do have a newborn at home. My my empathy and my um, you know <laughs> those things are going off for me. She's having some discord with her sitter right now. Um, okay, so signals for discord that we might see. Um, I, I there's an body language. There's nonverbals. I I love this image because I, it made me think about uh, times when I've perhaps had a new client and a first appointment um, in uh, thinking about the waiting area, and I've gone out and, and found um, a a veteran uh, in in the waiting room in this posture. What might go off in my mind are a few different things. What do you, what might you see here? Um, you might see someone who's uh, not interested in being where they are. You might see someone who's uh, the doesn't want others to see them, uh, just doesn't want to engage with anybody else in the waiting area, who might have had a difficult interaction with the uh, front desk people, uh, yeah, um, closed off entirely, closed body language, Thanks, so. Um You might also see someone asleep, tired, yeah, tired, tired, um, and so th there are so many um, nonverbal and uh, uh, body language, even through telehealth that we may be seeing and picking up on that could be hypotheses. We don't know what's going on with this person um, or if it's a signal for discord. You know, that person might also be anxious. Anxiety is exhausting. Trauma is exhausting. PTSD is exhausting. Depression is exhausting. Um, and so there may be that. They might, this might be a person who's protecting themselves, who's cautious, who's guarded, um, and who um, is, perhaps 
uh, has nothing to do with us, but maybe there's discord there. We don't know yet. Um, and there are many other, I'll give you a list here of potential signals of discord, defensiveness, arguing, more overt, challenging, discounting our, our um, credentials or our expertise, right? Um, hostility, overt hostility, interrupting us, um, talking over us, ignoring inattention, changing the subject. What I'd like to invite you to do here is think about, do you ever show up in your clinical work with some of these signals? Are we ever tired? Are we ever anxious? Are we ever finding ourselves interrupting our clients, talking over them? Um, maybe a little bit inattentive if we're doing work from home. Um, and yes, yeah. So our ability to recognize that discord is between two people. Um, it is something that we can either uh, contribute to or we may be able to help resolve and solve and bring compassion toward. And so the awareness of it is important and that's really what allows us to move into our, rather than wrestling with it and being defensive ourselves or hostile, that we can dance with discord, um, that we can move compassionately with another person by staying in the spirit first and foremost. And how we do that, I think, is what, what's helpful for me is when it's discord, I'm going to give it ample compassionate attention. If I ignore it, um, if I, or if I am hostile in response to it, or assume that that person is showing discord in that body language, um, and, they're, and myself, I get kind of stuck in it, or I might find myself feeling um, anxious about working with that person or unsure as well. But if I can give it ample and compassionate attention um, and, and broaden my view, right, and I'm not getting the honing in that our um, sympathetic responses do too much, if I can expand, and open up to that person's whole experience and understanding by taking a guess, maybe you seem tired today or sort of noticed um, your, your posture in the waiting area. And I'm curious that as I get to know you, what um, what that might mean for you. And oh, well, in my training, I'm, I'm immediately um, arms crossed. It's not really anything. Um, or they might say, yeah, I'm exhausted. I'm not sure about being here. I'm not sure about doing this. So what we're bringing are these approaches that help us to move through discord and, and as slowly as we need to, um, and be in that engaging process for as long as we need to be. Um, some of these skills, and I'm gonna put them up because I think we're having some technical delays here from my end. I'm just gonna list them all. Um, these really need to be done genuinely and um, skillfully at the moment. Uh, apology is not always necessary. Um, apologies, however, um, are are really just helpful from a human perspective. There, it, this isn't unique to MI or specific skill in MI. It's the genuineness that's important. If a per, if we make a mistake in our understanding of a person or what we do, and we 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 find that an apology is diffuse, diffuses a lot of tension, diffuses a lot of frustration, diffuses a lot of discord um, if it is connected. I'm sorry, you're tired is sympathy. An apology is I'm sorry that I said or did um, that, that, that may be um, getting in the way of our time together or how helpful I can be. Um, and our ability to do that sparingly and um, thoughtfully and intentionally can really help. Um, reflection, reflecting, reflecting, reflecting. Coming alongside that person is really maybe simple reflection. Um, you're, you're tired today. Um, uh, we can, when they say I'm tired all the time, and we might say um, it's, an, it's something that you that you live with. Um, and more complex reflection, just coming alongside them, not trying to change it or fix it, um, and being with their feelings and their emotions. Metaphor is really helpful with discord. Um, it's like you've had all these therapists that um, just um, treat you uh, like it's a kind of run of the mill. Um, they're just going through the motions. Um, that felt what it might feel like for them to have, have had that experience in their work before. Um, metaphor is a really powerful way of connecting as a human. Um, it's, it's your experience in doing that. Emphasizing their autonomy and their choice is really important when there's discord because especially when they've come from difficult therapeutic relationships before. Um, I'm gonna move pretty quickly since about five minutes here. Um, seeking collaboration, this is one that you're gonna find um, if you if you don't do this repeatedly, um, it, it's uh, it's common to not do that to kind of take for granted that we um, what 
what we're doing as we've agreed to do. Um, but I ask for that. Can we work on this together? Can we, um, is it okay if we take some time to step back and look at what, what's important to you? Um, or can I share with you some information? Um, that asking permission and seeking that collaboration, um, it, it, it's, uh, disarming um, in many ways. It's like, oh, wow, okay, so this person is um, really seeing me as a partner and giving me power in that moment. Um, they can often be, yeah, 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 of course, of course they can, that's what I'm here for. Um, so we don't want to do it ad nauseum where a person gets tired of it or feels ingrati it's ingratiating. Um, so again, all of these um, intentionally and just practicing them when it feels, when we pick up on those cues. So I want to share with you an example, am I response? many different potential responses. Um, if you were to choose to work with me, which is completely your choice, it sounds like you'd wanna know that you're being cared for by someone who has hope that things can get better for you. So this is an example of emphasizing that person's autonomy to choose to work with you or not, um, as well as a complex reflection of what they're saying, what that might mean about what they're trying to, to tell you, that if, if you were to work with me, um, you'd wanna know that, that I care. Um, and and leaving it at that and, and pausing there and am I for allowing it, not convincing that person or um, fixing discord by uh, persuasion uh, but really allowing them to hear that, that you're trying to understand um, and that, that they can say yeah here's what I'm going to need for you to show me that or um, there we can be there can be collaboration on that um, and that they know they have choice that emphasizing autonomy, um, as I said, is so consistent with the spirit and um, doing that throughout interventions as well. So in engaging, it can look like this. There's many other potential responses. Okay, another one, um, client. And this maybe we're in the focusing part. So we're really trying to focus on a particular target behavior or going into a particular therapy. So I know you want us to start that therapy you've been telling me about, but I've got some hard things going on with my family right now. Can we just talk about that for a few minutes? So this one in the chat, I'd love to see. Is this sustained talk or discord? What do you what do you see here? It might be a little bit more tricky. Yeah. Sustain, sustain, sustain. Okay. So this is where um hmm, yeah, Patricia, yeah. Discord. We want something different than they. So yeah, I hope you're really thinking. Maybe it's a little bit of both. Maybe there's a little bit of both. I wanted to lean on what if you think about this as discord for a moment, because so much of our work, and I know as a, as a PTSD and trauma specialist, I might be ding, 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 avoidance, right? Sustain talk, um, they're, they're not wanting to do the intervention, which is the target behavior, the, the change is engaging in the intervention. Um, but really, I, this first part, I know you want us to start the therapy. That language, I know you want us to do that. That is kind of that, um, in that moment that, uh, that, that client asking, can we just talk about this? Yeah, they're, they're maybe feeling um, pulled by us or that if uh, there's, I know you want this. Now, there's no right or wrong answer to this for sure. But if we think about this as discord for a moment, maybe in MI we would respond a little differently than if we're thinking about it um, in, in in another EBP as uh, not not ready, not engaging, um, and what might be then do with that. So if it were discord, um, some of those skills I just described, maybe we would take a moment and start with, I'm sorry that I took the lead and jumped in before checking in with where you are today. This is your time and my hope is that we can work together on all of the goals you have, family included. So starting with a genuine apology, if I, if I jumped right in, um, maybe perhaps I just had worksheets right out and ready to go. Yeah, and so taking the time to collaborate on the agenda and emphasizing that this is their time. Um, where, and, and pausing here, where might they go with this? So what we wanna recognize is this person might then be able to talk more about that family piece and say, yeah, I wanna work on all the goals too. I do wanna get back to the therapy. It's that in MI we're, we're sometimes um, going in a little bit of a different direction in order to help um, it, bring them back. So there's a little bit of that um, double-sided component I'll, I'll share within a moment of what we're doing here. Um, and again, if you thought about it as sustained talk, then you might be saying, there's part of you that wants to do the therapy, 
um, there's, there's a part of you that wants to talk about your family and there's a part of you that wants to do the therapy. You might just offer a different sort of reflection. Thinking about how in the moment you would need tone, you would need context to know for sure if it's discord. Um, but these are some of those advanced skills that can help us with that. Two more, and then our last minute. Now we're in evoking, we're talking about the work. I wanna get better, and I know the trauma work is important, but these worksheets were really hard for me. And honestly, I'm not sure I can do this. Sustain talk or discord? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So, we see a little bit of both here, both going on, yeah. And so I, I would lean on this one more towards sustained talk because there's no mention of you as a therapist. There's, um, there's, uh, there's their perception of the work and their experience of it. Um, not, I know you want us to do this and um, what can we do with our time? Um, a little bit more on the sustained talk in this, I would think. Again, tone and context matters a lot. A touch of discord perhaps, yeah. So. What do we do with this with sustained talk? We we do, we dance with discord. We soften the sustained talk. And so here we don't actually emphasize it. With discord, we spend a lot of time with it. If because if we don't, then the relationship foundation is not there. Um, we we give it compassion and ample attention. With sustained talk, we only pay as much attention to it as it needs. So we might be tempted in other approaches to problem solve the sustained talk. Those worksheets were hard. What was hard about them? Let's go right into the, the barriers and actually ask for more. But in MI, we actually listen for the change talk that was in it. Was there change talk in there in what that person said? And sort of sidestepping for a moment the sustained talk and reflecting the change talk that we hear and pulling that out and think about it as actually rescuing it for for them. Um, and without cheerleading or pushing, it all comes from their own language. Um, many of the same skills, click through, oh good, okay. Reflect, 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 come alongside that person um, with an emphasis on coming alongside, especially the change talk they gave you. Agreeing with acknowledging the sustained talk with a twist where we emphasize the change talk. And so that's where a double side reflection would be, we acknowledge the sustain, but end with the change. Acknowledge and then move into change. Same skills of emphasizing autonomy, affirm the parts of it that you genuinely are moved by that you can affirm. And if um, all we get is, sust is sustained talk, and you might be thinking, well, like how do I rescue change talk if all I'm hearing is sustained talk? Then maybe we need to shift focus for a little bit towards something that is important to them. And that's an invitation to think about time management wise in your EVP, is it okay? And uh, you might be thinking, I don't wanna collude with avoidance. If you're doing it strategically for five minutes, 15 minutes, half a session, it in the long run is going to perhaps more strengthen the relationship, which is the foundation, and make it more likely that they feel connected, understood, and ready to go back into the target behavior with you. So an example response, that's double-sided reflection. Part of you is doubting yourself right now, and at the same time, you feel connected to how important this work is for you. The ellipsis there is a pause. I would do what we call a pregnant pause, leave it right there. That's a double-sided reflection. And then, the, then perhaps that connection to what's important is what helps you show up today, even when it's hard. Example of an affirmation, it has to be genuine, it has to be that you, you felt moved by them showing up even when it was hard to do that. Okay, I'm going to skip the planning because that's not essential for it to be effective, am I? And it might leave you thinking, oh, I really wanted to see the planning one. You can practice this with, you know, in, in your own, listen for how does sustained talk or discord come up in planning? And what, how might you use these skills in MI to, to engage with that? Um, and to think about what do, you, what do you need to learn to do more? Um, am I consistent balance in your approaches uh, within your EVPs? Um, I want to give time for questions, so I'm going to pause here. Um, I will, if we can pause the slides for just a moment, then I'll skip ahead to the resources that I wanted to share with you all. Um, Kevin, is that all right? Yeah. Move into questions? Okay. That would be great. 
So I'll, I'll start with, I'm going to try to maybe bring these up in chronological order. I usually try to group them into like topics, but th these are all so good in and of themselves. So we'll see how many we get through. Um, early on, we had a question from Deb Novziker who said, what are language clues to differentiate between sustained talk and avoidance? I'm thinking they sound alike and may actually be pretty similar. Yeah, I and I, I've thought about this a lot, um, and and it, it, of course, please everyone use the chat if you if you've got ideas about this or what helps you do that. Um, it this is where it, it's about conceptual fit and and your your choice in the moment to talk about it with that person in an MI consistent way, or uh, that would be more about ambivalence. That would be the acknowledgement of both sides of them? Or do you do you feel in that moment it's important to stay in the um, style that's more consistent with your intervention that's focusing on avoidance? Because we, we don't conceptualize um, avoidance of change in MI. We conceptualize ambivalence about change. Um, and so if, if, for example, I were um, hearing in uh, in CPT, a person saying, um, I didn't do the, the worksheet we started because when I started to do it, the memories came up and, and I just couldn't, couldn't handle that. Um, I'm, I'm hearing the symptom of avoidance, right, as that comes up, um, that when, when there's a, a trigger activating and then their, their mental processes go to avoiding that. Um, and so that might lead me to even just simply acknowledging, so so that avoidance kind of came up in your mind, or that start blocking that out um, uh, by blocking by not doing the worksheet was 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 where you went with that, and it may just actually be a reflection about avoidance. And they can say, yeah, I uh, it came up, and I, if I don't do the worksheet, then I won't feel it. And then it might be an exploration of um, and, what, and then what happened, um, and and letting them come to did that work or not. And so in that way, you're um, if there's like it, didn't, it still stuck with me, I was still struggling. Um, it, we may be then in still in CPT, still in talking about okay, I avoided it, didn't work very well. So what do you what do you think we do with that? Maybe we do the worksheet. We can use open questions to sort of guide in a way that's consistent with our with the EBP. Um, or if they're they're still like it works fine. I don't know. I don't even know if I want to do this therapy because me avoiding seems to be working fine. There's then ambivalence about the therapy. And you may be then saying, you're not really sure you want to do this work anymore. And we may be more going into that broader, bigger picture of engagement in the therapy. What, what do you think about that? I'm inviting you to consider in the moment. What is the target behavior? Is it the worksheets, and then can I and I stay in the EVP and kind of use the Socratic more open questions that are more about guiding them um, to address avoidance, or is there now am I hearing more ambivalence about the whole therapy, and we need to kind of back up a little bit? Okay. Great question. I, I mean, I, that was a similar question I had too. I'm, I'm a PE therapist, so we talk about avoidance a lot, but I think even yeah. thinking about avoidance as more about ambivalence rather than like resistance or working against you. I, I think that's very helpful too. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And so, then we can have compassion for both. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and, and we can make room for both at the same time. It doesn't have to be one or the other. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And we can try it out. We can kind of go, okay, I went more in thinking of it as avoidance and talk with them about that. Or I went kind of more in, they're not sure about this. And, yeah. And there's room then for rationale, you know, revisiting rationale. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, I think we, we talk so much about rationale is so important in exposure therapies that they need to understand the model and what we're doing. So, you know, we're, we're partnering and not reach traumatizing and things like that. Um, but we often do it through, well, here's how it works. Let me come back again to the rationale for this and convincing when yeah. they know, you know, we're really evoking it from them. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, so another great question, and this might be a little bit of a change of gears. So Stephanie Wachter, and I hope I pronounced your name right, <laughs> um, says, question for the end of the presentation, if there's time, can you give an example of how you might talk about autonomy with a client in the context of, for example, mandated treatment? Yeah. So, yeah, so I, um, I think I touched on that, but didn't really give the example. So um, when I was, uh, I would do intakes um, in a, um, in um 
a community-based treatment center for um, uh, court-mandated abusers or um, perpetrators of interpersonal violence, domestic abuse. Um, I had my questionnaire I had to get through, right? <laughs> we all have these, um, you know, all of your all of your questions you have to get through. But I started every every time, at least the first 15 minutes, notepad was down on the table, just my hands in my lap. Um, it can, it can, I, I recognize that um, that you've you've been you know, sort of the courts have asked you to come here um, to uh, to avoid to avoid jail time. Um, can we talk for a little bit about what what this has been like for you? What 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 bring what make, brings you here and made you decide to do it? Um, and they. And that's a permission quote. Can we talk for a minute about that? Because they might just say, I don't even want to talk about it. Just, what are your questions? I want to go through that. And recognizing that the discord might be so strong um, because they're you know, identifying me with the system that's requiring them to be there. Um, and and then after you know a little bit of time with, with questions um, or with just and acknowledging that, like you, you, you're not really wanting to talk. You kind of want to go through these motions right now. Um, and we can spend some time on that. Uh, well, if they do tell me, so yeah, the court's telling me to be here. I don't want to go to jail. That's the main thing. So, <laughs> so for you, the, the choice to come was about like, you, you really want to do any, whatever it requires to stay out of jail. Um, that is still a choice to come because they, they can say, I don't have a choice, but the, the jail is a choice too, right? In that context okay. that, um, and so without, without again, without threatening or without saying so like it's it's here or jail you know that right like that would be not consistent <laughs> with MI uh, but part of them that says like so for you that the, the choice was um doing this as an alternative to to jail um you you want to be free you want to at least have your your time to do this yeah so so what do you already know about the program I might talk about okay I know it's like group sessions and um I gotta gotta be here for for all of them um and so talking a bit about uh that what that in, in includes, uh, asking them what, what do you envision this is going to be like, what are your concerns, um, and then talking a little bit about the relationship too, the the the, the violence itself, um, and the the choices that they made, uh, and how hard it it is to make changes. A lot of times, by the end of that conversation, they're saying, "I know I need to work on my communication better. I know if I want to keep the relationship, I've got to do this." Um, so there, therein lies their um, motivation, as well as the the um, choice they have to keep coming to get to those goals. Thank you. That is fantastic. I I'm looking at the clock, and I'm recognizing we're we're. Uh, quickly getting to the end of our time and we have some other questions too that we haven't addressed how about we do this first let's let's turn the mic over to mr micah norgard to tell us a little bit about how to do ce's get ce's you get your ce credit um and then if we have some extra time we can ask another question but would you be willing if uh if i forward the rest of the questions that we kind of scraped um if if you wanted to give like a, a couple of sentence a response that we can post with the archived recording of this webinar would that be okay yeah, sure. I'd be happy to do that. I really am excited to see them. There were so many great pieces of the chat um, yeah. that I did catch and so many things I didn't catch. So I'm really sorry if I didn't see all your comments. And so really, and even some good ones that came in after we started Q&A. So I, I, I hate to lose those because they're so good. So yeah. thank yeah. you so much for your willingness. That's excellent. Um, Micah, let me give you the mic. <laughs> thank you, everyone. And thank you, Dr. Burr. That was an amazing presentation. Oh, thank um, you. So uh, here, once we close out the, the room here in about two minutes, uh, we'll go ahead and take attendance. It can take up to about two hours, so please just wait about two hours uh, if your seminar is still uh, showing incomplete. So all that you need to do is log back into your My Account page, the same place that you uh, clicked the launch webinar button today um, in order to get here. Log back in, you'll see an orange certificate button. Click on the certificate button, complete the evaluation, and then after the evaluation, you'll be able to print your certificate immediately or even email it to yourself. Uh, I would recommend uh, emailing it to yourself so you have it there in your email uh, for history also. Um, if for some reason that it shows that your seminar is complete after four hours, just shoot me an email. Um, my email is everywhere on the website. I'll post it there in the chat as well, um, and I'll get to you as soon as possible. All right, thank you. I I wonder if we can like throw this question out there and we'll maybe attempt. We got like two minutes left. You ready for that? 
<laughs> this question is from uh, Allison Hewitt. She says, sometimes patients continue to focus on immediate stressors and therapy is constantly focused on putting out fires. This is in relation to the focusing example of sustained talk or discord. What's the best way to navigate this so that we can help a patient see that working on goals will help them manage stressors in the present? Uh, yeah, the ever-present life is complicated and gets right. in the way of therapy. <laughs> <laughs> which is yes. um, is difficult, right? Because we, um, I think for me, that's where the spirit of self-compassion has, has been helpful. Um, and when I feel overwhelmed by a client's experience, they're probably feeling that. It's like, this is so overwhelming. There's so many things going on in so many directions that you're, that you're feeling pulled in. Um, and so that's where a lot of um, empathic reflections of the emotion and feeling around it may be important and helpful. Yeah. Um, and because if I, um, if I do the opposite and if I sort of try to push in one direction or say like, I think this may be important for us to do um, this, you know, um, then uh uh, they're going to push back. So pushing, we just as humans, when we feel pushed, we push back. And you just become then another person in their system that's pulling them yeah. or another stressor. Um, so, uh, the, and this is me drawing from, uh, in the last couple of years, a strong interest in compassion-focused therapy, where there, there is a lot of emphasis on like, the, taking a moment to say, this, this is a lot, and there's it's overwhelming, and just spending a lot of time in, in that. And then when they can say, yeah, it is, and I don't know what to do or where to start, that we might then be tipping our toe into focusing. So you, uh, you'd like to find a place to, to, to figure out what to do about any of these things. Um, and yeah, I would, okay, so can I, and asking for permission, can I kind of list some of the things that I'm hearing seem to be the most distressing? Let me know um, where we might go from here. And so then they say, yeah, it's all those things. It's family, it's my mental health, it's my sleep. Okay, um, of of those, what could we maybe spend five, 10 minutes on just, just with that for a few minutes to, 